the Scaling Japan podcast. A podcast about how to grow your business from $100,000 and beyond. And beyond. In the land of the rising sun. Welcome to the Scaling Japan podcast. I'm your host, Tyson Batino. And on today's episode, we have Terry Lloyd. Terry is a serial entrepreneur from Australia and New Zealand. And Terry has established 20 companies in Japan and has brought his investors eight successful earnouts. And Terry, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, thanks very much for having me on the show. I'm not just a serial entrepreneur, I'm a startup serial entrepreneur. In that, after my second or third company, I, I realized that actually I don't like running companies of more than 100 people. And the reason is because you're no longer at the coal face, you don't get to invent anything, you're just managing lots of other people. So I decided uh, probably 15 years ago that uh, I would just do startups. And once they got to a certain size, sell or IPO, but I don't want to sort of stick with one baby and see it all the way through to old age. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> I can totally relate because uh, the first company I founded, OneCoin English, has around 150 staff. And actually, as of two weeks ago, I have uh, stepped down and am making my new company. So I probably can relate more than most people what you talk about. And for me, the sweet spot is really uh, 10 to 30 employees. Absolutely. Yeah. Congratulations, by the way, on realizing that a lot of CEOs don't realize that. And then they become a burden to the rest of the company as it tries to move forward, but they just don't have the skills and the mindset uh, to run a business that's more of a top-down organization, a hierarchical organization versus a all hands to the deck type. No, I totally get it. And you know, in my case too, like I really had to work like 60, 70 hours a week, plus get a lot of feedback to, you know, make those stages from like 10 to 30 to 50 to 100 to 150 and i kind of got to a point where it's actually like i want to spend more time with family and uh rather than continuously uh having to reinvent myself for each stage i just thought about like uh what really was the ideal stage for me and when did i have the most fun in the company <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great that's great that you can uh, spend time with your family I probably wasn't quite as diligent in that respect. I, I have a very close relationship with all my kids, but I do have one ex-wife and uh, I'm currently married happily to my current wife, but some of us are good at life work balance and others uh, work as like a big playground and we got to try all the different attractions. And, and I guess that's me. <laughs> so I'll give it a try for another six months, but you never know. It's uh, I have the itch in me, so. We'll see. But yeah, so the reason I brought uh, Terry as a guest on today's podcast was I was talking to a lot of entrepreneurs and just asking them like, you know, what topic would you like to hear about? And the, the one thing that continuously came up among entrepreneurs who already have a business, they're already somewhat successful is how do I get investment in Japan? And I was thinking like, who could I talk about this? And I was like, the only person I can really talk about, or there's many people, but I definitely need to get Terry on the show to talk about it, as uh, you are kind of a legend in the foreign community. Yeah, I've, I've had my ups and downs, I must say, but certainly I had a very uh, successful early period during the 80s and 90s, and I feel like uh, the tide is turning again. I did have my downs, uh, Lehman shock, earthquake, uh, that was a pretty traumatic period. I, I bear a lot of scars from that. But it's been helpful because uh, it's reminded me that this whole thing, this whole trip in life is not about ego. It's about other people helping and also being helped. And, you know, you're alluding to the fact that I've done a lot of startups, actually at 17 here in Japan of my own, uh, although I've been involved in others. Uh, and I've lost count how many overseas. But the most exciting part for me in starting a company is to conceive and then pull together the initial team through till when you get really competent people and they're ready to take over that that's like the best part and it also corresponds to the thought processes and the methodology behind getting funding so I, i'm a strong believer well first of all let's uh look at the you know the elephant in the room 
we're not on the west coast of the USA. So we're not going to kind of waltz into some big organization and say, hey, we're going to change the world and get a lot of funding. First of all, that kind of funding in Japan is rare. And then secondly, for non-Japanese to access that kind of funding is even rarer still. And so most people wind up either having to bootstrap or they're relying on friends and family to get started. And uh, I don't know about you, Tyson, but uh, for me, that's exactly what has happened. I you know, know 17 companies, about half of them were bootstrapped and, and the other half uh, were friends and family kicking in and, and helping me get started. In my case, uh, we were totally bootstrapped and it's uh, with the several owners. Uh, I'm the only foreign one. And I was lucky that uh, one of the other partners or the business owners, it was his third company. So uh, we got to scale really fast and I got to learn from the master. You got lucky. So I tell people that they're out of 100% of entrepreneurs, 5% of them are lucky. And the other, <laughs> the other 95% have to work really hard. And if you're going to do bootstrap, my rule of thumb is add five to 10 years onto the life cycle of the business. So uh, that's a very good rule of thumb. Yeah. So basically, if you don't want to spend that five to 10 years, then you better get out there and start hustling amongst friends and family. The good news is that we live in an environment where there are a lot of people who have savings and you don't need to get all their savings to start your company. You just need a, a modicum amongst a, a bunch of people. The rule in Japan from a securities point of view is uh, you're allowed to solicit and accept investment from 50 people. And so uh, 50 people is a lot of people. You know, if you had a million yen from 50 people, that's 50 million yen, which for most startups is enough to get them started and to get a product through to beta. And so uh, that's why I encourage people to do friends and family, because it doesn't have to be a heavy burden on your friends and family. And if you have a decent network, then, you know, you can easily reach those targets. So, you know, the two questions arise from that. Uh, so first of all, do I have a practical case, use case, and, and I'll provide one. And then secondly, how does one build that network? So the use case that I'd like to use is, is japantravel.com. As I mentioned, I went through a really ugly patch in the 2000s through till 2012, basically. And uh, just totally caught out by the Lehman shock, totally caught out by the earthquake, totally exposed. So I couldn't bootstrap and stay mentally sane at the same time. But one really good thing is that I do have good creativity. And I decided to uh, create a crowd sourced user generated travel site, which of course became japantravel.com. And uh, we started off just as a project. It wasn't a company, uh, it was called Japan Tourist. And uh, from there, we segued uh, in 2013 into japantravel.com. So for the first probably year of japantravel.com's life, 2014, things were going pretty well. We were signing up a lot of people writing and we were getting uh, quite a lot of interest and traction. But our business model was all around you know, selling media, selling ads. Oh, I see. Right. And the problem was that we were too early. 2014, most Japanese companies in the travel industry didn't believe that there was a ground shift going on. And so they just weren't ready to advertise. And the foreign players, well, they're all small. And so some advertise, but, you know, basically not a lot of money out there at the time. But I could just sense that we were in the right space at the right time. So I had a newsletter up until two years ago, actually, called uh, Terry's Take. It is an amazing newsletter. Uh, thank you for keeping it. Uh, actually, I'm really thankful that you've kept it online. And actually, with some of my coaching clients, I actually share with them several of the newsletters. Well, I do plan to resume it. But for 21 years or 22 years, I, I did it religiously every Sunday. So my kids grew up knowing that Sunday night, you know, daddy was in his office writing his newsletter and mummy was complaining because he was writing his newsletter. <laughs> but uh, even now I have about uh, five and a half thousand email addresses. So it's a great way of getting in front of a lot of people at the same time. 
And, you know, I was thinking about uh, how to raise funds for Japan travel. So I went to Cool Japan. I went and saw 23 different venture capital companies. One offered an investment, but they wanted control of the business. And mm -hmm. so I just not going to go there. So I was at a low point, you know, uh, uh, losing faith, which is not a good thing as an entrepreneur. And then suddenly it occurred to me, wait a minute, maybe I should eat my own dog food. And uh, I ran an ad, uh, it was about 50 or 100 words in Terry's take. And lo and behold, I had 40 people respond to me saying, hey, we've been reading your newsletter all these years. We feel like we know you. We'd like to take a chance and invest. So uh, from that, I got, uh, I think from memory, 14 people signed up. We raised like 30 million yen. And that got us through and started, you know, we started uh, hiring more people and developing software and, you know, all the things you do as a, as a startup. Uh, 2015, I did the same thing again and raised another 30 million yen. In 2016, same thing again. So I only ran two ads each year. It was kind of like people <laughs> got to realize that, well, if we want to get in, maybe now's the time to do it. And so uh, in the end, I think I have about 34 small investors totally, but they weren't all like one and two million yen. There were a couple of investors that came in for 10 or 20. You just never know. You never know who's out there and you never know what they think of you and what they think of the business opportunity. But by 2016, it was pretty obvious that the market was really starting to move and the company itself was doing okay. So here's the key part. So after raising roughly 100 million yen, I wanted to segue to uh, something a bit more structured. Normally, that would mean going back out to talk to VCs or whatever. I decided not to go for VCs. Here in Japan, there's a very interesting channel of funds, which is uh, corporate strategic investment. And those strategic investors in my prior experience do not require control, but they just simply want some way of being able to connect your business to their business so that they, it improves their bottom line. So sometimes they want tech, sometimes they want to piggyback on your customer base. Sometimes they just want to see what you're doing so that they can apply it to their own sector. So I decided not to take any funding from 2017 and 2018 and instead drive the company on what we had, a million dollars is fairly significant, uh, through to profitability, which is what we did. And then in 2019, I managed to bring in a strategic investor, which was a large real estate company, obviously with uh, strong interest in uh, hotels and holiday properties. And so that company put in uh, the best part of another million dollars, which made a huge difference to the company. Well, it would have been huger if it hadn't happened and then suddenly stopped us from being able to do business. But still, in terms of progression, that's my use case. Now, the second part of the two points that I mentioned uh, is about how to get that audience. When I first started Terry's Take, which was in 1990, three ninety five actually i don't remember exactly when but uh anyway it's a long time ago i was young dumb and stupid i'm just now i'm <laughs> old old dumb and stupid but uh anyway uh so i really didn't know uh what i was doing but i knew that somebody needed to express to the community what it was like to be a foreign business person in japan you know japanese don't need this information obviously there's plenty of stuff out there but for foreigners who love Japan and want to live here and somehow don't fit and so they want to become entrepreneurs or run their own business or whatever there's like a dearth of information certainly back in the 90s there was yeah and I think people don't understand how little information there was especially anything tactical anything tactical that's right and then furthermore you know, most of the strategic thinking that was being written down was coming from investment banks. And you wouldn't see that until six or 12 months later, because of course, the, you know, when it's timely, that only the clients, the paying clients got it. And newspapers don't share opinion, really, right? I mean, they're supposed to report news. And so there's a dearth of analysis of opportunity. 
and plenty of after the fact things, but but not much before the fact, which is you know most useful for for most of us who are in business. We're trying to anticipate what's going to happen. So anyway, I started writing about uh, this and that, uh, mostly about companies, people doing stuff in the market. But slowly but surely, I found that I also had to learn macroeconomics. And actually, I became quite good at it and started understanding the moving parts in the Japanese economy. And then I would wrap that around events and I'd start reading between the lines about events that were going on. Like you would see some company in trouble, but there was a lot of smoke and, and you couldn't see the fire. But if you follow the money, you can usually figure out what's, who's doing what to whom. And I never shied away from kind of like making that jump. And sometimes I was wrong. And when I got it wrong, I would have 100 or 200 people tell me I'm an idiot. <laughs> and that's, that's happened more than once. And then, uh, when I, but when I got it right, months later, people would come back to me and say, hey, you, you hit that nail on right on the head. And uh, a good example of that is when Gon uh, was deposed in Nissan. And, uh, you know, I mean, when it happened, I, I said something super fishy going on and I identified some issues. And then a lawyer who had just resigned from the company contacted me uh, quietly on the side and actually said to me, out of all the commentators, you're the one who got it right. So that was pretty fun to get that kind of feedback. So what I'm saying here is that, um, first of all, you got to reach out to people and you got to step outside your comfort zone and you need to be an expert on something. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, these days I'm an expert on sourdough bread making with sake kasu in it. And uh, actually I have a bit of a following in the sake kasu sourdough market, which is small, but but I'm the expert, you know? So yeah, I, th I thought you were joking, but uh, <laughs> thanks for cl clarifying that you are an expert. Yeah, in that particular field. So, you know, anyway, you become an expert in something and then you grow. And as long as you're disciplined, more people will find you. So I started off with, uh, well, obviously, uh, a few dozen people on my email list. Uh, what I did is that every time I went out and exchanged a name card, I would ask that person if I could put them on my mailing list for my newsletter. And uh, at first it was hard going because people didn't want spam. But as my name started to get known, more and more people uh, decided that they wanted to be on the mailing list. And at one point I had about 15,000 people on my mailing list. As I say, today I have about five and a half or 6,000. But 15,000 so, back then, that's like, that's like the equivalent of maybe like 60,000 now. Yeah, it's gold. And the thing is that the great thing with email is people open it and read it. It's not like, you know, quick scan, one, one second glance, and then they're on to the next thing. That email is sitting there until they either open it or, or don't open it. And uh, I did learn one thing, a very important thing, and that is that whatever you're writing about, it, that has to go into the headline of the newsletter. So you keep the name of the newsletter real short and you don't say volume, whatever, because that's boring stuff, right? So I always had TT, the number, and then what the topic was. Uh, gotcha. So when it arrives in the email box, the person can see the whole what this episode or what this take is about in one glance without it being cut off by the letter restriction. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. And also because people just can't be bothered even clicking or hovering on it to see what the rest of the title says. Yeah, I, I, I had roughly 20-30% uh, open rate. And when you're dealing with thousands of people, that's plenty. And then those people would refer to other people and cut and paste and whatever. And then the whole thing just like makes its way out into the universe. So the only negative is that uh, over the last five years, I've found that uh, Google is making it harder and harder for people to run large list email newsletters. Part, they say it's because of spam. I think it's because they're trying to force everybody onto Gmail. I guess I'm a conspiracy theory, theorist. <laughs> but uh, in any case, I do have a very good guy who helps me keep our white hat status. And at this stage, you know, we're, we're still able to send out those 5,000 and, and not get too many rejections. And so, to clarify, uh, white hat hmm. status means that 
you do things that may, can optimize uh, send or optimize what you're doing in marketing, but it doesn't go against the rules or it doesn't go against rules that haven't been made yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these days it's a function of somebody saying, oh, this is spam and, and marking it as spam. It's really, it's really simple. And once you get marked as spam with Google, that's sort of like a terminal. Then people have to unmark you as not spam, which is really difficult to do. Yeah, and I think the key point you mentioned, which is actually a core, one of my core beliefs in how I design, how I'm creating my new business, is that distribution is everything. So uh, having the right idea is also very important. But if you have distribution, and in your case, you had a very engaged audience of 6,000 to 15,000 people, myself included, who would read your newsletter every Sunday. And once you have a large distribution, you go blast off into space like a rocket That's because right. you have the right idea. You're not dealing with the friction of interacting with people who don't know you because they already trust you. And it's just making sure you have the right idea. It's what people need. You communicate the right way and you follow up and make sure that customers are succeeding with that service or product. Yeah. You know, it's also important if you want to reach a lot more people than you can biologically meet. And I always had a target, by the way, of meeting 20 new people a week, which I did from uh, 1993 until the start of COVID. Uh, so I have a really large Rolodex, but still 20 people a week is nothing compared with thousands a week if you have the right channels. It's all about uh, sharing your personality so that people can feel that they get to know you. You use the word trust. Trust is super, super important. How do you build trust? By sharing by letting people see what kind of person you are and what your values are. Like what you're listening to and ready to scale your company? Let Tyson coach you and your team to make the jump. You can find more information about our coaching and advisory services at www.scalingyourcompany.com. Now, back to our podcast. And that is one of the core reasons uh, I'm doing this podcast, actually. You know, instead of networking with uh, 20 people or 50 people a week, right now, uh, you're actually guest number 10, and we're at about 70 listens per episode. And we're just getting started. And so when I meet people in the future, they would have listened to me for hours and hours on end. Unfortunately, they'll know my voice. They'll know kind of like my personality. But if we're a match, like, you know, I've already done the work through the podcast. So, and like, and so what I like to call it is I'm going with a marketing strategy to reduce the need for a sales strategy. That's right. A sales and marketing are two sides of the same coin. So let me just return to the topic of uh, fundraising, because I, I know that that's why probably most people want to hear that. So I, I've raised funds for quite a number of companies and they've come from different places. Mostly we're talking about startups. My general advice to entrepreneurs, start, beginning entrepreneurs, is that first of all, you have to show skin in the game. So if you haven't put your own money into the company, okay, if you're in the States, maybe that's not so important. But here in Japan, it's super important. So people ask me, well, I don't have much money. How, how do I do that? Well, first of all, I think if you're not putting in at least three to five million yen of your own money, you're just not like moving the dial, right? So if you haven't saved up that kind of money, how are you going to even survive the first year because you won't have enough to live on? And if you're married to feed your family, I mean, that's going to be pretty tragic. Would so, doing something like establishing a corporation, a KK, and maybe doing a five million in initial capital or Shihon Kim, would that be one way of doing that? Absolutely. And the great thing in Japan is that you can not only use the capital uh, immediately after it's been recognized, but actually you can uh, charge costs of uh, associated with setting up the company even before you receive the capital. And then uh, I'm sure you know already, but you don't actually have to have that capital. You just need to have it in the bank for assessment period, uh, which I, I think is three days or something. But from a practical and pragmatic point of view, yes, uh, 5 million yen is a great skin in the game start. So anyway, so I tell people that they need to really start with that. If you don't have 5 million yen and you're really itching to get a company started, go borrow it. Now that brings up the next topic, which is borrow from where. And I tell people that 
if your idea is not powerful enough and if you don't have enough self-confidence that you're going to be successful, then why are you starting a company? And if you are convinced that it's going to be successful, why are you not asking your family and close friends to be part of that success? A lot of people say, well, I don't want to hurt my family. I don't want to hurt my friends. That is an answer that tells me that person is not convinced they're going to be successful. Now, you know, you don't have to hurt your family and friends. First of all, if they don't want to invest, they shouldn't invest. And you shouldn't be badgering them to make them do so. But as I pointed out before, you can have up to 50 people without invoking any securities issues. And so a million yen here and a million yen there can make a huge difference to your company. And if you're borrowing it, well, it's on the record that you're going to have to return that money sooner or later. So if you don't have it yourself, try your family. If they're not going to help you, then try your friends. And if they're not going to help you, then maybe you better wonder why nobody's helping you and do something about your personality and the way you interact with people. And I think you brought up a good point that's uh, you're not necessarily taking advantage of your family. You could present it how you would normally present to investors, to your family, and you would give them enough information to make, I mean, it's early stage, so as reasonable position as possible, you could present. That's right. So so the second way that founders can contribute to their company in, in a capital sense is that they set a realistic salary, not a optimistic salary. Realistic in, in our world is uh, enough to live on. And maybe plus 100,000 yen or something. And instead of taking that 100,000 yen as a salary, they lend it back to the company. And so uh, they build up equity uh, through by virtue of the fact that they're not taking much more than they need to survive. And, you know, in terms of hard numbers, let's say as a founder, you took 250,000 yen out per month as salary that for most people, they can survive sort of on that. As a family, they can't, but as an individual, they might be able to. And then, you know, maybe fair market value for their salary is uh, maybe 600,000. But, you know, no one's going to invest in somebody who's paying themselves top dollar right from the start. So you have to show humility. And, and probably an appropriate number is around 350 or 400,000. So 250 you take out, 100, 150 you leave in. That all adds up. That's 2 million yen in the first year onto the capital of the company. Yes, you have to pay tax on it. So that's a negative. But on the other hand, you're showing skin in the game. And what I find is that the next level of investor, which is angel investment, angels look to see commitment. And as long as they can see commitment, then they, you know, check off their rest of the boxes, you know, business model, competence, uh, team quality, that kind of thing. So then the angels, once they see that that person is invested, they will put more money in. Now, this brings us to the question of, well, I get this a lot from early startups. I've got 10 million yen of equity and our company really needs 30 million yen to get kickstarted. I don't want to give away 75% of my company. What can I do? And the answer to that is that the amount of equity that you put in a company is not the value of the company. It is the value before you go out and offer shares to somebody else in the company. And it's a sign of your commitment and the fact that you've got skin in the game. So there's nothing to stop you from going out to an investor and saying, Mr. Investor, my company is now valued at 100 million yen. And I want 30 million yen of your money or 20 million yen of your money. And I've already put in 10 million. And for a lot of people, this is mind boggling. How can I go from 10 million yen of paid in capital to 100 million yen of theoretical capital? Well, it's all about a marketability. If somebody likes something enough, they will pay more for it. You you just need to look at NFTs and naked apes to see that. (laughs) So... Basically, if you think your company is worth 100 million yen, as long as you can justify that it's worth 100 million yen, uh, then the investor will agree to pay their share price at 10 times the share price that you paid. 
and that's how you make up the difference. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. In the West Coast, uh, Silicon Valley, in return for uh, investment, you would give up uh, equity. But uh, in Japan, but what are some things that you would need to give an investor in return for money outside of uh, equity? Well, you actually bring up two questions because there is another way of bootstrapping a company, which is to use debt. And actually, that's the traditional way here in Japan. And uh, let me just diverge for a second and, and just talk about debt. So th there are two forms of debt that all startups use here in Japan before they get equity. The first form is called credit cards. And so while you're working for a good company, before you go out on your own, you're probably getting a decent salary and you have a good salary track record, uh, usually of more than two years. If so, get as many credit cards from as many different issuers as you can. Some credit cards are connected, and so you know you have a practical limit of two million yen. But if you go to different issuers, you can. There are about I don't know, maybe five or ten of them here in Japan now. You can get two million from each different credit card company. Now I'm not saying to run the company on credit cards, but the thing that kills companies is not shortage of cash. It's not shortage of capital. It's it's shortage of cash at a critical time. So for example, if you can't pay your salaries at the end of the month, if you've got a really good relationship with your employees, they might stay one more month, but after that, they're going to leave. So it's okay to lose money as a company, but it's not okay if you can't meet your immediate payment requirements and credit cards are good for that. So credit cards, you can obviously, you can buy stuff on credit, which means that you can spend the cash out a bit longer. And of course you can get credit card loans which ranged from 8% uh, to about 13%. The second form of credit or debt in Japan is um, actually pretty good. There is an organization called the Japan Finance Corporation. Uh, it used to be called the Kinyu uh, Koko, but I forget what it's called now in Japanese. But anyway, JFC. The JFC, as long as you meet their business plan requirements, because they assess your business plan, generally they'll invest 5 to 10 million yen and then they'll let you come back two or three times for a bite at the same apple. And actually in one of my companies, this is going back years now, I actually got up to about 80 million yen in loans from uh, JFC. Oh, wow. Which amongst foreigners was considered fairly significant leverage. I don't know that they'll do that these days. So generally they reserve those high leverage loans for you know old timey Japanese companies that have been going for a hundred years or 200 years. but for those of us who are foreigners, at least 5, 10, 20 million yen is pretty common over a period of three years. Now, this won't give you a rocket boost ride, right? This is like slow burn, bootstrap, traditional Japanese style uh, fundraising. So if you want to go faster than that, then you have to sell equity. Okay, so back to your question, what else do you have to give up? It depends what kind of investor you're dealing with. When I deal with early stage investors, what I give up is a guarantee that they won't get diluted. It's called a ratchet clause. And I have a ratchet clause in all of my early stage uh, contracts, what we call a, a, a stock purchase agreement, SPA. And that ratchet clause says that if the next round, not subsequent rounds, but the next round is underwater, then the founders will release enough shares to the existing shareholders to top them up so that they are not underwater. So it's kind of risky because it means that the founders may give up more equity than they anticipated. But it's really great for shareholders because it means that the next round will never be a down round, which is kind of a good, nice guarantee. And it allows uh, the investors some feeling of confidence both in the future and also in the confidence of the founders themselves that they're going to do well because otherwise they lose some more stock. Yeah, and I think from their end too, they'll feel like uh, you're putting their needs first. Uh, that's right. And then uh, usually with the SPA, I also write uh, what's called an SHA, a shareholder agreement. And as you may know, uh, most Japanese companies, well, all Japanese companies have articles of incorporation, but they're very, very vague. And so a shareholder agreement is a great way of going straight to the heart of the matter and saying, hey, these are the rules that the company will operate by. Like, for example, we guarantee as a company, uh, we will do a, a business plan six weeks before the end of the fiscal year every year. 
and stuff like that. So the shareholders agreement is kind of interesting because it's actually a side agreement between each shareholder. And it actually sits outside the framework of the company, even though the company is involved. And every shareholder has to sign it, otherwise it won't work. So within the stock purchase agreement and also within the shareholder agreement, there are going to be things that you might give up if things go bad. And one of the most common ones is if the company goes bust, then the last investors in, who are obviously taking the, paying the highest price, uh, usually they will get first dibs on liquidation of assets. That means the founders generally will wind up with nothing, and then the people who are lasting will get some of their money back or, or maybe all of their money back. So those are two common things that you would give up. A third thing is, obviously, as I said, if you have a strategic investor, they may want to have some rights related to selling some product or being involved with your product in some way. So like, for example, a very common form of funding at the moment from Google and from various other companies, Alibaba is just getting into it, is that they want to do all your hosting. And so if you're a software company and you have a SaaS model, they want to be your host for life. I'm not sure I think that's a good idea, but anyway, that's a form of funding and a commitment that you have to make. I've never thought about it in uh, those ways as well. Uh, very cool. And I guess my next question would be, uh, outside of you know family and friends, how can a business owner go about finding investment? Well, it, again, it depends what stage you're at. If you're really early stage, the best way is from friends. So you talk to people about your business idea, you solicit their input, and if you're lucky, you even get a couple of clients before you start. And if you can do that, then either, well, usually the clients themselves won't invest because that might be considered a conflict of interest. However, their friends and your circle of friends will hear about the deals, from, presumably from you, if you're allowed to talk about them, and then that will give them confidence. And then, you know, people just put their hand up and say, hey, I want to invest. Obviously, the way I did it for Japan Travel is that actually I went out, out online and I said, I'll take the first 50 people who contact me. And so, as I say, 40 people contacted me and 14 or so actually wound up investing. So, you know, there are plenty of people out there who wish that they could start a company, but they have golden handcuffs. They're in some big company making tons of money. And so they want to live the startup experience through the startup. And the best thing you can do for those people is to be in constant communication with them and share your ups and downs because that's exactly why they've invested. They've invested because they believe in you and also they've invested because you're helping them have an experience that they themselves are not ready to have but wish that they could. And so if you can sort of like create a content mentality and not be trying to protect yourself all the time, Actually, people really get into it and then they start trying to help you and introduce other people. And, and that's what it's all about. So you're living your life as a piece of content, basically. What's that? A reality show, right? You know, as, as long as you think about content, uh, then you sort of gain some confidence, I guess, in the fact that what you're doing is unique. It's interesting for people. And you also start to figure out that you really need to be a good storyteller. And actually, the, the best people at fundraising are the people who can tell good stories. Obviously, they should be stories with a <laughs> basis of truth. But, you know, what's a good story? A, a good story has pathos in it. It has somebody struggling against all the odds and winning out. And that means not putting a smiley face on everything but telling people when there's gut-wrenching events that happen. And what people want to see is, well, I, I had this friend who gave me the best advice ever. He said, he bets on the jockey, not the horse. <laughs> and so, you know, if you're the jockey, you got to show good form. And the good form is not just winning races. It's also being able to recover from setbacks so that people feel like, man, I really like this guy, you know, He's got all these setbacks, and if it had been anybody else, I would have lost my money, but he's still in there, and he's still fighting the good fight. I'm going to support him. 
Wow, this has been a very awesome episode. And I can actually think of uh, five entrepreneurs. I'm probably going to send in this uh, after the recording because uh, I think a lot of the things you shared was uh, exactly what they needed to hear at this exact time. And uh, so I think we're kind of coming on the time. But I remember you mentioning that you do help people, I think, like an investment brokerage service. Is that correct? Yeah. Right. I have a consulting company called Japan Inc. Holdings. And actually, about 12 years ago, we operated as a boutique M&A advisory business. My last deal at that time blew up really spectacularly. Not my fault, but uh, anyway, <laughs> I, I invested a lot of money in making that deal happen. So I, I got out of the business for quite a long time. But about two years ago, I started getting approached by friends who were trying to sell their companies because COVID is making a lot of people reassess their priorities. And so, so far, I've helped uh, one company to do a buyout, and now I'm helping them to uh, recapitalize. And then I helped another friend to sell his company, he got a very good price for it. And now I'm helping a friend to finance a bridge, of all things, uh, oh, down gotcha. in Osaka. Can you explain what a bridge is for the audience? Yes, okay. Well, this is not the bridge you're thinking of. This is a real bridge that people walk on. Oh, walk. gotcha. I thought it was more of an investment bridge. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. No, no, this is a real <laughs> bridge. Uh, so, but good point. Yes, there are investment bridges as well. This is going to be Japan's longest pedestrian bridge. And uh, my friend won the rights uh, to build this bridge over a new dam, which is just being completed uh, this month, actually. So uh, anyway, he's raising 400 million yen. And I've been uh, helping him to find that money. So, yeah, I help entrepreneurs. It's kind of fun and I know how to do it. Is there a sweet spot in terms of the people you can help with this service? Every case is different. The first company I mentioned that did the buyout was a med tech company. The second company was an SMS software company. It's all about the founder, the business, and what the buyers are looking for. If the buyers are looking for tech, then that's one thing. But if they're looking for customers, then obviously you, you need to have the customer base. So I take a look at each company. I, I talk it in depth with the founder and then try to assess what I think their chances are and where they're likely to be able to get help from, either in terms of somebody buying in, buying out or investing. So yeah, each case is different. If there was a sweet spot, it's that companies under a million dollars are hard to sell because the due diligence for the buyer is really high. Maybe they're going to pay 10, 20 million yen minimum uh, for accountants and lawyers to look at the company and see what condition it is. So generally speaking, I find that a company that's doing five to $10 million is easier to sell. But if it's a software company and it has very high margins, then a million dollar company is sellable. Thank you so much. And in the show notes, we'll put uh, links to your or links to Japan travel, uh, links to your consulting. And uh, I'll confirm with you after about potential other links we could add in the show notes as well. But thank you so much, Terry. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, hopefully that will help somebody somewhere. I can definitely think of five people already. Welcome to the end of the podcast. We appreciate you listening to the end of this Scaling Japan episode. And if you would like more great episodes on scaling your business in Japan, please check out www.scalingyourcompany.com forward slash podcasts.